Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so happy to see you all today and to welcome you all to another Explorer Classroom. Here at National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration and wonder to change the world. Um, all of our National Geographic Explorers believe the exact same thing. Our explorers are these amazing cutting edge scientists, researchers, conservationists, storytellers, adventurers, filmmakers, photographers, teachers, and so much more. But the one thing that they all have in common across all of their very diverse, amazing work is that they love sharing and talking with students like you. So Explorer Classroom events bring exploration to life with short lessons with our explorers and extended Q and A's with students around the world. This fall, we're hosting Explorer Classroom for ages 9 to 14 on Thursdays at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And today on Explorer Classroom, our explorer is Violeta Jelixkova. Violeta is a biologist at the National Museum of Natural History in the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. She studies cave microbiology and chiroptology, which is the scientific study of bats. Violetta is also conveniently a very passionate caver who explores extreme underground environments. It's very helpful as she looks for bats and conducts bat science. And today we're celebrating bat science and tons of awesome bat facts for folks. I can't wait to learn all about these amazing creatures, but before we do that, I do wanna take a minute to acknowledge all of the students we have joining us today. This morning, we have about 1,300 students registered to join us from all around the world. So give a cheer when you hear your location or your school. We've got students representing Australia, Arizona, California, Canada, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, the Dominican Republic, Estonia, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Illinois, Indiana, India, Indonesia, Ireland, Kansas, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Maryland, Maine, Michigan, Missouri, North Carolina, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Carolina, South Africa, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, Vermont, Washington, and Wisconsin, and probably more places too. So if I happen to miss where you're from, you can let us know in that chat bar. We'd love to say hi. But I want to give some shout outs to schools out there. We've got the Amvit Boulevard Elementary, the Broach School, Kasmir Pulaski School, Center for Inquiry number 27, CM Apps, Concord Area Special Education Collaborative, Dodge Elementary, DPCDSB, East Jackson Elementary, the Ecology Africa Foundation, Estelle Manor School, FPSA, Fur Elementary, Galix High, Gems World Academy, Glen Hills Middle, Granite Street Elementary, Harvest Academy, Henry Huck Elementary, Hickory Middle, the Hughes Learning Academy, IK Academy, the Kilmer School, Lentrada Middle, Lafayette Elementary, Lakeside Academy, Mesa Elementary, North Star, OCV, Olson, Oriole Park, Parkside Community School, Pennock Elementary, Robert Frost Middle, Rundell College, St. Aloysius, Slayman Education Center, St. Elizabeth, St. Faustina, Somerville ILS, Toronto District School Board, Tulane University, Tolaire Union, Vernon Elementary, the Village School, Weber Middle School, and William Ramsey Elementary School. There's so many of you amazing people out there. I wish I could get, give every single one of you shout outs, but I think that's probably enough for me for now. So let's turn it over to Violetta for today's Halloween themed Explorer Classroom lesson on bats. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm really happy to, to be here or not exactly here, but virtually with you. And uh, I'm really grateful that uh, there are participants from so many places uh, in the US uh, and the world. And it's, a, it's really a great pleasure for me to share some details of, uh, of my work. And I'm really looking forward to, to your questions afterwards. So I'm gonna share my screen now. so that I can also share some bad facts. So I actually uh, started working with a case uh, since I was 16. So, so that's, uh, that's still high school. And what I love about case is uh, that everybody can get dirty there and no one is angry about that. Mm. Do you see my slides changing? 
or I haven't seen it change yet. No. Hmm. Didn't it's working before. Ah, yes. Okay. So that that's my nice dirty dirty picture. So you know you you can see a lot of adults getting dirty and being happy about it. So everybody feels so free uh, in caves. Sometimes uh, we also get really wet and we can even get into some dangerous situation. So that's one of my study caves where I work for my PhD. And that's how it looks when you have to enter the cave. So this is about 10 meters high and it's, it's completely vertical. And because uh, ropes are too heavy to carry, we decided, oh, okay, we'll just go without ropes. But uh, I have to admit you that it was pretty scary because all the good holes are actually under the water. And it's not a tropical cave. I, I uh, heard that there are some students from Indonesia. So their water in case is nice and warm. Here it's about freezing temperature. So you have to be really tough to, to be able to, to go down uh, this, uh, this water. Uh, but it's working because there is colony in this case uh, of around uh, several well, several thousands of bats that are very, very interesting to, to research. In other caves, we have uh, other type of difficulties. Can, can I see from you uh, how many of you think uh, this is a very big space, like for many people to, to fit in? Or a small space? Most of you think it's a small space. Let's see how small it actually is. It's that small space, and that's that's very very usual uh, in caves. So we we not only have to squeeze in uh, in tunnels this big, but also carry all our luggage and equipment. So this shot is from the deepest cave in Bulgaria, where we went to collect some microbiology samples. So why am I doing uh, all this? Uh, not only because I like case at adventures, but because I really, really love bats. For me, these are the cutest animals in the world. And here uh, I have um, shown you my favorite species. It's called the long-eared bat. You can easily see why. And my absolutely favorite thing about this species is that when he's cold, he can fold his ears backwards and hide them under his armpits. The previous time I asked the students to do this, we discovered that for humans, it's very, very hard. <laughs> but yeah, bats are amazing. And not only that, uh, bats are very important for, for us, for, for all the people and for almost all the ecosystem on Earth. And I'm gonna tell you why now. So first, all the bats in the temperate region, so like almost all the bats in the US, for example, they eat bugs, different kind of insects or other invertebrates. And they have huge appetite. So one bat, especially if we take uh, a mother that is now feeding her baby, can take as much food for one night as it's his own weight. So imagine if some of you weigh, for example, 50 kilos, imagine eating 50 kilos of, I don't know, burgers for dinner, just for one dinner. That's how much bats eat. So this means that they are very, very important regulators of insect quantities in the world. Without bats, there will be so many insects that they will eat all our crops and damage our forest. And if we want to prevent this, we'll have to spend too, too much money for pesticides. Plus, you know, our food is not very healthy if um, there are too many uh, pesticides used uh, on it. And bats, uh, help us have uh, healthy food. Also, bats that live uh, in the tropics, 
Okay, Indonesia students, you have a lot of these fruit eating bats. Um, they are very important plant pollinators or they disperse the seeds of plants, including uh, plants that are uh, very important for us, like the banana, for example, uh, or the cacao. So the next time when you're eating a very tasty chocolate and you enjoy that, think that the cacao plants in the wild are actually pollinated by bats. Last but not least, bat guano. Well, that's the bat poop. And here, uh, my colleague is on the top of a pile of bat poop, actually. It's very important for cave ecosystems because there are many cave bugs and other small animals that um, feed on it. And also sometimes if there is a river in the cave, this guano can, uh, can go out uh, and actually fertilize the forest. And uh, what I'm researching exactly, it's actually a problem that bats have. Most of you have probably heard uh, that uh, COVID uh, may have started from bats. Yes, it's indeed possible, although we cannot say for sure because these events are very, very hard to trace. But there is a disease that kills millions of bats in the US and it's most probably brought around by humans. And uh, that's uh, what uh, my research is about. It's uh, about the white nose disease in hibernating bats. And you, you can see this bat is sick and that's why he has this white fungus growing uh, on his nose. That's how this fungus, the white nose fungus looks uh, in a petri dishes where we grow it uh, in, uh, in our lab or under the microscope. And what is very interesting about the white nose disease is that actually it occurs everywhere in Europe and Asia, including Bulgaria where I live and work. However, it doesn't cause any mortality here. And that is because it is native for, for this region. It usually occurs uh, there or it has been occurring uh, they are since uh, thousands of years. And uh, bats have already adapted to the white nose fungus, so they can have it on their nose and they are totally fine with it. However, in the US and in Canada, exactly the opposite happened because the white nose fungus was only recently introduced to North America. The bats don't have any immunity and they die. So, so if you remember, this is bad not only for the bats themselves, but also for human, because there is no natural insect controller during the night. So, so the US has to spend, for example, billions and trillions uh, of dollars for extra pesticides. And that's not only expensive, but also very unhealthy. So if we protect the bats, we protect ourselves too. And what what, uh, what is the human involvement in, in all this? Can somebody raise a hand if you think that bats very often fly across the Atlantic Ocean? Yeah, I don't see that many hands. Okay, so I have very smart students and you're absolutely right. The Atlantic Ocean is too big for, for bats to, to fly across. But what, what about people? Do people fly across the Atlantic? Yeah, I mean, not only with their wings, <laughs> very few people have wings, but with planes. Uh, so most probably it was uh, the humans uh, who transported the uh, spores of the white nose fungus from a European cave to a cave in the US. And then it started growing and killing bats. Uh, so, so that's very important. Now everybody hears about uh, uh, measures how to protect human health, which is of course very important and ve very, very needed. I saw th that the students have masks in their classroom, which is great. But also we need to think about the health uh, of uh, animals and plants and be careful not to transport, anim to transport animal or plant diseases around the world. 
other things that uh, you can do about bats uh, is to protect their habitats. For example, you can put a bat house in the forest or even in the city because there are many bats that uh, that live uh, in the in the city uh, around you. Or if you have an old house, uh, you, you may probably have bats that uh, live in the cellar, for, for example. Also, it's, uh, it's very important to protect uh, the old trees that, uh, that are around the place where you live. Uh, see, see the holes in this tree. Uh, there can be houses for bats, for, for birds, and for many, many other animals. So if you have an old tree around, look at it like a treasure. And lastly, if you like adventures like me, uh, and if you like traveling like me, don't forget to wash your equipment. Well, that, that's how my friend washes her equipment <laughs> in the river <laughs> because you know her mom will be angry <laughs> if she brings all this mud in the house in the washing machine. But jokes aside, washing your equipment when you travel is super important for protecting uh, bats and other animals from, from diseases. And it's not very hard to do. So thank you for your attention. I hope you love the bats even more after my talk. And uh, I'm ready to answer all kinds of your questions. Oh, I'm glad you're ready to answer questions because we are already getting so many in the chat. Thank you all for sending them in. Keep them coming. Please don't spam us. You only need to send each question one time. We keep track of everything that you send. Um, and please let us know who's asking. We'd love to give your class or your student a shout out when we ask the question. We've gotten so many great ones, Violetta. My favorite question so far, we've got people wondering if bats can swim. If bats can swim, uh, I've actually seen some videos of bats swimming. So yeah, like all mammals, they, uh, they can. It's, uh, I don't think they like it very, very much. So they, they won't do it deliberately. But uh, if you happen to throw a bat in the water, uh, he will be able most probably to swim out. So cool. And we've got Sarah Clark asking how climate change is impacting bats. Oh, that's a very good question. So it's uh, it's hard to, to come up with uh, one answer because in the world there are 1,300 or even 1,400 different species of bats that live in very, very different environments. But uh, a few examples I can give is when temperatures are, um, are rising, uh, bats in the temperate uh, regions um, shorten their time for hibernation. So hibernation is the, the so-called winter sleep. So they they, um, they spend the, the whole winter inactive uh, and lower their body temperature because uh, there's um, uh, not much food, not, uh, not many insects flying. Uh, and with climate change, uh, bats hibernate less. Uh, however, when they arouse in the winter, there are, even if the temperature is higher, there are still not that many insects because uh, insects also look uh, at, for example, the length of the day, not only the temperature um, to determine their active periods. So, so it may happen that the bats uh, arise from sleep, but still they don't have anything to eat. Uh, or it may happen that um, uh, their physiology is uh, impacted because hibernation uh, is very important for bad physiology and bad life cycle. But st we still need uh, more research to be answer uh, to be able to answer this uh, this question uh, in more uh, more detail. Um, and of course, in terms of the white nose disease, uh, a shorter hibernation season is actually better because this fungus only grows in bats. Uh, during hibernation. So, so it's uh, also a uh, positive impact for some species, but for sure we need more, more research to, to be able to handle this, this problem better. Awesome. I think the most common question we're getting right now is how old do bats normally get? 
Madame Champlain's class was asking that. And then Leah Mitchell was asking sort of a variation of that. What's the oldest bat that we know of? Oh, that's a really great question. And uh, bats are actually amazingly long-lived. So far, the, the longest living bat, uh, bat recorded has been 41 years old. And uh, that, that's really a lot for a small mammals because I don't know if, if you have noticed, but uh, there is a relation between the size of the mammal and how long it lives. So usually big mammals like us can live long and small mammals. So imagine for example, a mouse, they, they live uh, for a very, very short time. And bats uh, together with the naked mole rats are actually the, the exception for, for that. They're very small, but they can live very, very long. Uh, so actually, um, there are many researchers in the world that are trying to uncover the molecular mechanisms of how bats age, or actually how bats don't age, so that in the future we can uh, apply this to humans. That is so cool. Uh, now we've got everybody wondering how fast can they fly? We've got username mysterious mates leading that charge. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, well different uh, species of, uh, of bats uh, fly with, uh, with different speed. So there are some that are slow flyers, for example, the little horseshoe bat that uh, uh, hunts close to vegetation, but there are uh, some bats that, that can fly incredibly fast, like the um, uh, Brazilian free-tailed bat, for example, or other species of free-tailed bats that can fly, if I'm not mistaken, uh, at speed above 60 kilometers per hour. So for, for sure, a uh, speed comparable with the speed of the car, and they cover very long distances doing that. Awesome. Well, I think the very first question that hit the chat today is, have you ever been lost in a cave? Uh, I haven't been very seriously lost, uh, but, uh, but yeah, it, it has happened uh, that uh, it, was, uh, it was hard for, for me to, to find my way. Uh, luckily, my friends uh, helped, uh, helped me. Um, Basically, caving is, is not an activity that you, you do alone because there are too many risks. So you always have to have good friends with you. Awesome. Well, speaking of good friends, we've got a bunch of them up on screen with us. Let's take some questions from some on-screen groups. So get those nice loud voices ready. Let's visit Mrs. Dalliver's class first. Um, I would like to know, um, that we have lots of caves here in Kentucky. So um, have you done any research here? Uh, well, I haven't done any research uh, in the US uh, so far, but uh, I'll be ve very, very happy to, to do. For example, I want to compare my research here in Bulgaria with the white nose fungus, uh, with uh, the research from the, the US. Um, but uh, yeah, so I hope the lockdowns are, are over soon and I can visit. I hope so too. Let's visit the Puro family for our next question. Go for it, folks. How many pairs of babies can bats have in a lifetime? Well, that's a very good question. So, well, bats usually have uh, one baby or maximum two at a time. So, so they are um, similar to, to humans because, you know, when the, the mummy bat flies, uh, she has to carry the baby with her. And for it's very hard to carry more than uh, one baby. Uh, so when they grow up, the bats maybe when they become two years old, they may start having babies. So it, uh, it basically depends uh, on how long uh, a bat lives. So, so count one baby per, per year. But also there's these things that bats that reproduce and have babies each year may die earlier than the bats they don't have babies uh, each year. So it's hard to calculate uh, an average number, but I don't know, maybe I would say around around 10 babies if, uh, if a body is productive and 
uh, help in, in a total of uh, the lifespan, but it's one per year. Awesome. Well, let's take our next question from Mr. S's Bulldogs. Go for it. Okay, so I have my fifth graders here and some of them are asking questions about the sizes of bats, how big and how small. So like, what's the largest bat and the smallest bat? So the largest bat is the giant flying fox. Uh, so it has a wingspan uh, like an adult's uh, hand span. So it's really big bat. Luckily it is just fruit. So it, it cannot uh, bi uh, bite us. And uh, the smallest uh, bat uh, in the world, um, at least in Southeast Asia, and it's called the bumblebee bat. And it's uh, as small, like it can fit on the top of, uh, of your uh, nail, ba ba basically. It can fit in a, you know, mattice box. Wow. And what kind of different things do the super big and super small bats eat? Well, usually the small bats eat very small insects. Uh, and uh, all the big bats, the so-called flying foxes, uh, feed on, uh, on fruit. Cool. We've got Miss Rabbis's class in the chat bar asking some, some more questions about the different types of bats out there. They're wondering what different types of climates bats live in and if bats normally only live in one type of climate or if they can live all over the place? Uh, yeah, well, bats basically live uh, in all continents in the world except for Antarctica. So, so di different species can, uh, can live in, uh, in different uh, uh, climates. But uh, you, usually one, one species prefers one, uh, one type of climate. For example, there are temperate species of bats that, that hibernate or tropical species of bats that, uh, that don't hibernate. But in general, they are, they are quite tolerant to, to changes and they are very adaptive. The problem is that we are cutting a lot of forests nowadays, especially in the tropics, and they are, they are losing their, their home place. All right, well, let's go to Mrs. S's class for a question. Go ahead and turn on your microphone and ask away. Hi, our question comes from Benjamin, and he would like to know if bats can be tamed or domesticated. Very good questions. Actually, bat, uh, bats are, are smart uh, animals and uh, they can be tamed to, to some extent. So you cannot have a bat as uh, a pet because it's not healthy for, for the bat to live like a, a pet. But otherwise, they can be taught to, to do different things. Uh, for, for example, this picture that I showed you during the presentation with the bat eating the cricket mm -hmm. is made in the bat research station in um, northern Bulgaria. And uh, this bat was trained uh, for several days before so, so that he could catch the cricket exactly at the right place and the right moment for the photographer to uh, to take the picture. So you, you can also train them to uh, solve labyrinths or to, to feed from specific places or even to feed uh, from, from your hand. Um, so yeah, they, they, they are uh, trainable. So cool. Well, we've got an interesting question. Are bats related to mice? And if not, what are they related to? Uh, bats are not related to mice, at least not more than we are related to, to mice. And they are quite a separate uh, evolutionary branch. So, so basically the branch of bats separated from, from the other mammals maybe around 60 million years ago. Uh, so they are not that much similar to any other types of, uh, of mammals. Cool. We've got kid conservationists wondering if you've had a favorite experience with a bat. Does anything really stand out in your mind? 
Our favorite experience? Well, there are so many uh, experiences uh, related to bats that uh, that I like, but uh, I can tell you one funny story. So um, I was um, mapping the distribution of bats in protected uh, areas in Bulgaria with uh, with some, some colleagues. So for we, for the whole summer, we were spending every evening catching bats. And um, once a colleague of mine caught a very fat and fluffy bat and he decided that it was so cute and he put it very close like this to his face and then the bats beat my colleague on the nose. <laughs> And the, 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 it hurt so much, my colleague, and he, he dropped the bat, but uh, he kept like clinging on his nose and like, and it was so fun. That is amazing. What a funny nose ring a bat makes. Um, which brings us to another question from the YouTube chat bar. Folks are wondering if bats can hurt people. I guess the answer is yes, technically, but maybe you want to elaborate more? Well, yeah, of, of course, uh, if you catch them, they will uh, try to, to bite you because uh, you're a threat for, for them and they will, uh, they will try to, to escape. So I have been beaten many, many times by but uh, if you are not doing anything to, to harm them, they will never attack you. So for example, if you have a bat uh, in your house uh, or if you visit a cave where there are bats, uh, um, uh, bats will never deliberately attack, uh, attack human. They, they will uh, try to escape. Uh, uh, if they uh, feel threatened, but they, they will not attack you. Awesome. Well, bats are so associated with Halloween and they have kind of this villain persona that you were addressing there a little bit. Is there anything else that you think people think about bats that's just flat out wrong? You want to? Uh, well, one of the wrongest thing that, that I've heard is that they want to fly to you and uh, just get stuck into your hair. Well, believe me, that's not pleasant for, <laughs> for any animal. Uh, and I, I guess the, this comes from the fact that uh, bats orient themselves by echolocation. So sometimes if they want to see uh, something in more detail, they have to come close. And it may uh, seem to, to a human if a bat is flying exactly towards him that the bat is attacking, but then uh, actually the bat wants to just see what, what is there. And then he will turn around, but uh, no, no bats are, are, are trying to, to get stuck in humans here. That makes sense. Um, I guess the other thing that we think about with bats and Halloween is like drinking blood. Is that a common bat behavior? Uh, well, there are three species of vampire bats uh, in the world. Uh, so out of 1,400, like you can <laughs> estimate the, the proportion uh, of, of it. And uh, these species live in uh, Central and, uh, and North America. For, for example, if there are students from Mexico, yes, you, or maybe Costa Rica, I don't remember. But I heard some, uh, some tropical countries in there. So, so they, they may have the, the vampire um, bats. But they, they very rarely attack uh, people. They, they usually uh, drink blood from, from other animals. All right, we've got a lot of people wondering how bats protect themselves from the cold. Uh, well, basically all the bats that uh, live in, uh, in cold regions uh, hibernate uh, during the winter. Uh, so, so basically they um, uh, lower their body temperature almost to, to the temperature of the environment. So that's like just just a few a few degrees, and uh, and their heart uh, beats really really slow, and their breath is really really slow. So that's this mechanism of uh, of conserving uh, the the energy, so they they can spend the whole winter without food, just relying on their bed supply. And they, they, uh, there are many species of bats that hug each other, so no social distancing, and uh, they, they keep their, their temperature um, 
a constant like uh, like this and from time to time they change like the bus that have been on the edge of the cluster uh, change with the ones that are in the middle so that it's hair for everybody. Awesome. We've got Ms. Akers class wondering why you started studying bats. What drew you to them, Violetta? <laughs> Well, I told you that uh, I started uh, exploring caves uh, since um, I was at high school. Uh, and then um, I was thinking, okay, when I grow up, I have to find a serious job. But then if my job is very serious, I won't be able to, uh, to go to caves often enough. Then I said, well, okay, I can just work with bats so, so that I can go to caves as a, as a part of my job. And uh, I went to the um, Museum of Natural History in Sofia and uh, I met uh, some of the local bat experts and they were uh, kind and brave uh, enough to take me in the field. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how it started. And then I started to discover how many scientific opportunities there are related to, to bats. So, uh, it's it's not only fun and adventurous to go and do research in in case, but uh, then if you bring the knowledge uh, that we can get from bats to the lab, that you can make really big discoveries. Awesome. We've got another one of those questions in the chat bar that just cracks me up. We've got students wondering how long bat legs are. Bat legs? Yeah. How how long are bats' legs? Uh, yeah, well, well but, but legs are, are not, not very long, uh, but they're, they're very big. So, so actually, but feet are really huge in, in comparison to their uh, body size, especially uh, if you take uh, a baby bat. Uh, so so uh, imagine a human baby wearing shoes the size, uh, the size of the dead. Uh, so... Um, uh, that's uh, that's how big bat feet are because when the baby bat is born, uh, he has to to cling to to the mom's body and uh, and he does it uh, with um, the nails of uh, of his toes and he needs big and strong uh, strong feet since the the first day of his life. Awesome. Well, let's take another question from Miss S's fifth graders. Go for it. You can unmute. Okay, so this question comes from Kayla. She wants to know what has been the most dangerous situation you have been in. The most dangerous situation? Hmm. There have been a few. Mm. Uh, I can uh, tell you about one that uh, happened in the, the cave uh, with the water vertical uh, part that I showed you in the beginning. Uh, so two years ago, uh, I was there on my way up, uh, and uh, then there was a, a huge stone falling, like uh, like this this big, like a a big old TV. Uh, and then uh, my, my teammate that it was in front of me warned me that there, there is going to be a stone a stone falling. Uh, but I didn't get it was that big and I moved, I was like, okay, I'm going to move, but like just one, uh, one step. And then this stone fell like five centimeters next to me. Like, and I was just looking at it and I was like, okay, <laughs> this, this was close. Cool. But it happened so fast that I, I didn't get scared because I didn't realize what, uh, what was happening. But uh, yeah, it was a matter of five centimeter difference. Wow, that really puts things into perspective. Let's take our next question from Ms. Dalibur's class. Go for it, folks. What creatures are than bats live in caves? And if so, what challenges do they face? Uh, the bats in caves? Other than bats. Uh, other than bats. Uh, other, other animals that live in caves? Yeah. Hmm? Did I understand correctly? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So, so uh, in Europe, bats are the only vertebrate uh, animals that, uh, that live uh, in caves. Oh, at least in Bulgaria. Yeah, there, there's uh, one other animal called the cave uh, Proteus. Uh, 
So it's a type of salamander, but it has no skin pigment and, uh, and no eyes. And uh, for example, if you go to a country like Croatia or Slovenia, so somewhere on the Adriatic coast, you can, you can see it. There are some cave fish too. There, in the US, there are a lot of cave fish, by the way. They are also white and, uh, and blind. Uh, and uh, the challenges for, for them are sometimes when uh, people visit caves too, too much, too intensively, they may disturb them. Or also the, the pollution can be a, a threat uh, uh, because they, they are, are usually water in caves is very, very clean. So, so it means that um, these animals are, are sensitive to, to pollution. Cool. All right, well, you mentioned no pigment. So it's a perfect segue to another chat bar question. Have you ever seen an albino bat? Uh, I personally haven't uh, seen an uh, albino bat, but uh, so some of my colleagues have. And uh, yeah, they're, <laughs> they're really uh, uh, amazing. Awesome. Let's take another question from Mr. S's Bulldogs. Go for it. Yeah, I have a student, LeBron, and his question is, um, when um, bats kind of um, use their echolocation, can they communicate with each other too? Uh, well, not exactly at the same time, uh, but uh, yes, they, they use uh, sounds to, um, to communicate with, uh, with each other. Usually there's a different types. So they have echolocation that aims to find prey and there, uh, there are social sounds that are meant for communication. But uh, sometimes there are bats that eavesdrop for um, because when bats get cl gets close to an insect and the pulses of the echolocation uh, calls, uh, they uh, get closer to each other so, so that the bat can have higher resolution and to catch the insect. So other bats may hear that and say, oh, there must be insects around and also go, uh, go there. Uh, so, so yeah, they eavesdrop. Amazing. Well, Violetta, what advice do you have for all the young explorers out there joining us today? Uh, what advice I have for the young explorers? Uh, well, really never, never give up exploring. And don't forget that uh, uh, there are places that are unexplored, uh, very, very close to us. For, for example, some of the students like from Kentucky said that there are many caves there. And I'm absolutely sure that uh, there are uh, caves there that haven't been visited by, um, by humans so far. Um, so despite the fact that we are all connected by the, the internet and then we can Google so many things, there are places uh, on, uh, on Earth that are unexplored. And for example, it's very hard for and very expensive for us to go to space or to the very deep ocean. But if you want to go caving, that's neither hard nor, nor expensive. And if you become a part of a caving club, that it's very probable that at least once in your lifetime, you'll go and step on a place where no human has been before. That is so cool and exciting and really makes me want to go outside and look around. Um, Violetta, this has been amazing. What a cool way to celebrate Halloween. Thank you for everything. Folks at home, if you're as inspired by this lesson as I am, please let us know what you do with it. Maybe you make an awareness campaign or draw a comic strip about this or make a story or produce a video. Your teachers can interact with us on Twitter. We're at Nat Geo Education. We use hashtag Explorer Classroom and we'd love to celebrate all of your cool work um, and all of the awesome exploration that you folks do. We also have tons more great events again every Thursday. So if this time works for you, we'll be right back here. I do want to call out that in the United States, our daylight savings time is about to end. So if you're joining us from outside of the United States, double check your time zones for next week for us. We, we want to make sure you get to see us live. Um, thank you all so much for coming today. Thank you again to Violetta. This has been so much fun. A huge happy Halloween to everyone. And students, you've been so patient, so quiet. 
I'd like to invite everyone to turn on those microphones. Let's get nice and loud as we sign off. Let's scream um, happy Halloween to Violetta. Ready? Three, two, one.